Oh, come on, somebody. Oh, no. That little stinger gets me fired up about this series. I am so glad that you are here with us as we kick off our brand new series, Ghost Stories. This series is going to be all about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost. Or if you weren't raised in a Pentecostal church, the Holy Spirit. How many of you uh, have a Methodist background? Maybe you, you grew up in a Methodist church or you went to a Methodist church at some point in your life. Methodist, where are you at? Raise your hands. All right. Uh, where are my, my Presbyterians at? Presbyterians, Presbyterians. All right. All right. A few less. All right. Lutherans. Where are my Lutherans? Lutherans at? I got like one Lutheran in here. Some of you raising your hand for like multiple ones. Um, <laughs> like I've tried all of them. Where, 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 are my, where are my Catholic people at? Catholic people? All right. My Baptists. Where are my Baptists at? Wow. Wow, 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 wow. You know, there are, uh, I mean, some people are like, you know, I don't understand all the differences between all the different, you know, denominations and all that stuff. And so I'll, I'll make it simple for you. So Protestants do not recognize the Pope as the leader of the church. Jews do not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And Baptists don't recognize each other in the liquor store. <laughs> There you go. There's denominations for you. If I offended you, that's my wife's fault. Um, I run all my jokes by her. I was like, man, I probably shouldn't say this, but I really want to. And she was like, go for it. Say it. So if you get offended, you can send the email straight to her. Because she told me, it's okay. That's how you know the difference between all of the different denominations. All right, where are my Episcopalians at? Any Episcopalians, also known as Catholic light? Yeah, yeah, got a couple um, in here. All right, where are my Pentecostals at? Always the Pentecostals, right? I mean, just say it, like, woo, right? It's just, they're always the eccentric ones, right? All right, how many of you are like none of the above, just good old heathen? Where are my good old heathens at? Just no church. Thank you. See, I love these people. These are the easiest people to pastor, right? Because you don't have to undo all the bad theology that they learn from their denomination. Just tell them what the word says and they believe it. You know, but I've noticed that when it comes to the Holy Spirit, many times our denominational lenses, the teaching that, that we received about the Holy Spirit can keep us from receiving everything that God has for us. In, in fact, some of what we're going to be talking about in this series is the reason for all the different denominations, right? Like what people believe about the Holy Spirit and his present work in our lives has been the source of much division in the the church. And so uh, what I would like you to do during this series is I would just like you to set aside all the teaching that you heard on the Holy Spirit and come to the Word of God with an open heart and an open mind to what the Scriptures teach. After the series, if you decide that you want to, you know, still hold on to those beliefs that you have, even if they don't necessarily line up with what we believe here as a church, you're welcome to do that and to still be a part of this church. But but I just want you to approach the scriptures with an open heart and an open mind, not through the lens of what tradition told you, not through the lens of what your denomination or your angry grandmother told you about the Holy Spirit, but what the Bible actually has to say about the person and power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I've titled this series Ghost Stories because, you know, ghost stories are, are, are spooky and, and weird. And, and some people love ghost stories and other people are terrified of them. And I think that exactly describes how many people feel about the Holy Spirit. Some people think he's spooky and weird. Some people love him, right? The Pentecostals who are, woo, they, they, love, they love Holy Spirit. They've been waiting on this series for like ever, right? And so they love that. And then other people, you know, they're terrified of the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing. If you think that the Holy Spirit is, is spooky or, or weird, then you are going to distance yourself from him. You're not going to try to get to know him, which is exactly what many Christians have done, which is why they know more about Catholic. Casper, the friendly ghost, than the Holy Ghost. 
right? Like God the Father, we know, right? Like we understand the role of a father in our, our lives, whether you had a good one or a bad one, we know what the role of a father is supposed to be. So we understand God the Father. We know Jesus. He became one of us. We can read about him in the gospels. He died on the cross for our sins. We know Jesus, but the Holy Spirit, uh, we, we don't really know about the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't help that some translations use the term Holy Ghost, right? I mean, that just even sounds spookier. We're talking about a ghost. Nobody wants to get to know a ghost, but the Holy Spirit is not a ghost. In fact, our word ghost comes from the Anglo-Saxon word ghast, G-A-S-T, which simply means spirit. And so they called the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghast. And so when the King James Bible was written, that that Elizabethan English came from the the Anglo-Saxon language. And so they translated it as Holy Ghost, which simply means Holy Spirit. He's not a ghost. He is God. And so in this series, we want to take some time to get to know the third third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. We want to remove the fear, the misunderstanding that people have had about the person of the Holy Spirit so that we can experience his power in our lives. And that's why I've titled the first message in this series, I Ain't Afraid of No Ghost. (laughs) Right? I ain't afraid of no ghost because I am convinced that one of Satan's main strategies to keep us from walking in everything that God has for us is to make us think that if we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to be like those weird people, right? And so the enemy shows us weird people doing weird things in the name of the Holy Spirit so that way we don't want anything to do with that. And can I just say that those weird people doing those weird things, it's not the Holy Spirit that did that. It was just them. They're just weird, right? Those people would be weird without the Holy Spirit, right? And so the Holy Spirit doesn't make us weird, but he shows us those things thinking that if we believe what they believe about the Holy Spirit, we're going to become those really weird, strange people, right? And so we ignore the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Meanwhile, many Christians are living in perpetual defeat in their battles with temptation. They're crippled with fear and anxiety. They're powerless to overcome the attacks of the enemy and they're lost without guidance or direction. And it's because we've shut out the life-changing power of the Holy Spirit. And so today, I just want to reintroduce you to the Holy Spirit. And you don't have to read very far in the scriptures before you encounter the the Holy Spirit. In the second verse of the Bible, it says this, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And so the Holy Spirit was hovering over the darkness in the chaos to bring order. And that's exactly what he does in our lives. He hovers over our darkness to bring order to our chaos. Now, from this point in scripture, the Holy Spirit just began kind of goes into the back scene. He begins to work from the background. He's still active. He's still present. He's still working, but it's not as, as noticeable um, un, until you kind of move in and see. And then he shows up again in Exodus chapter 31. And in, in Exodus 31, God fills this guy Bezalel with the spirit. And, and so uh, Bezalel and what they're doing right now at this point in scripture is they are building the tabernacle, the place where God would dwell in the Old Testament. And how does God build his temple, the place where he's going to live? By filling somebody with the spirit to do what they can't do on their own. This is what we refer to as the anointing. See, the anointing empowers us to do what we cannot do in our own ability, right? All right, the Holy Spirit anoints us, empowers us to do what we cannot do on our own. See, without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I am a below average pastor and preacher. Don't say "Uh uh-huh too much on that, all right? But, But I'm telling you, I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to do what God has called me to do. But, but don't misunderstand it. The anointing isn't just to help preachers preach. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is to help entrepreneurs start new businesses. It's to help designers create. It's to help authors write. It's to help educators teach. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is for everyone in whatever sphere of influence they find themselves in. And I just love that the very first person that God filled with the Spirit wasn't a pastor or a prophet. It was 
was a craftsman. It was artists and construction workers. These are the first people that God filled with the Spirit, which shows you that the anointing of the Holy Spirit is to empower you in whatever field of work you're in to do something beyond what you can do on your own. This is what the anointing of the Holy Spirit does in our lives. It was the Holy Spirit that anointed Joshua to lead the people. It was the Holy Spirit who came upon Samson and gave him supernatural strength. It was the Holy Spirit who anointed David as king. It was the Holy Spirit who gave Daniel the ability to interpret dreams. It was the Holy Spirit who empowered Zerubbabel to build the temple. In the same way, the Holy Spirit worked and moved in the lives of these individuals. He wants to work and move in your life, anointing and empowering you to do beyond anything that you can do in your own talent and ability. And that's just a glimpse of what the Holy Spirit did in the Old Testament. We see in the life of Jesus in Luke chapter 4 in the New Testament, it says, then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So Jesus was filled with the Spirit and led by the Spirit, because whatever you are filled with, you'll be led by. If you're filled with greed, you'll be led by money. If you're filled with anxiety, you'll be led by fear. If you're full of yourself, you'll be led by your own ego. Whatever you are filled with, you'll be led by. So if you want to be led by the Spirit, you need to be filled with the Spirit, right? In Luke 4, 18, it says that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. So even Jesus needed the anointing of the Holy Spirit because gifts make us impressive, but the anointing makes us impactful. Uh, I hope that every time I preach, more than just my gift is working, I hope the Spirit of God is working and moving. I love it. It says in Acts 10, 44, that while Peter was preaching, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening. I pray that happens every time that I speak, that while I'm speaking, the Holy Spirit would fall upon those listening, that the Spirit of God would begin to work and move in your life because we need more than gifting. We need more than talent. We need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, that Jesus was raised from the dead by the Spirit. Can I tell you that the Holy Spirit is still in the resurrection business? So it doesn't matter if your marriage is dead, if your business is dead, if your finances are dead, if your relationship with your kids is dead, you can experience a resurrection. So even when all seems lost, even when hope seems gone, it's not over because the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And one breath of the Holy Spirit can cause every dead thing in your life to come alive. Can we all act like we're Pentecostals in this church today and get an amen. Thank you. Thank you. And so if Jesus was filled, led, anointed, and resurrected by the Spirit, then how much more do we need the Holy Spirit in our lives? That's why just before Jesus left, and he told his disciples, it's to your advantage that I go away, because if I go away, then I will send the helper, the Holy Spirit to you. See, I haven't even talked about any of the benefits that the New Testament says belong to us because of the Spirit's work in our lives. See, the New Testament tells us that the Holy Spirit empowers you to love. He reveals the deep things of God. He distributes gifts to those who believe. He edifies the church. He brings freedom. He strengthens you with power in your inner being. He makes you righteous and holy. He builds you into the person you are meant to become. He empowers you to speak the good news to others. He helps you understand understand and recall the teachings of Jesus. He leads, guides, and directs. He gives you joy, hope, discernment, and wisdom. He pours out the love of God in your heart. He helps you in your weaknesses. He prays for you when you don't know what to pray. He pleads your case before God. He is your advocate, helper, defense attorney, the down payment of heaven, the presence and power of God living within you, promising to complete the work that Jesus began in you on the day that you believed. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. You know, I do all of my work on my computer, and one day my, uh, my computer had a problem. The space bar wasn't working. 
which means my computer wasn't working. Because if you can't use your space bar, your computer is useless. You can't type anything. And so I did the same thing I always do and have a problem with my computer. I took it to my wife. All right, she is the, the tech expert in our family. Every, every family's got one person who knows a little bit more about tech than the other person. I know absolutely nothing. So I take it to my wife, and I'm thinking she's going to have to, you know, take it apart, open it up, find the part that's broken, order the part, and replace it. She's done that before. Um, and, and, and if it was something that's beyond, you know, simple part replacement, then I thought we're going to have to send this thing off to a repair shop, and it's going to be gone for a couple of weeks before they can get it back to me. And so I'm thinking about all these, these scenarios where I'm going to have to go without my computer. But she didn't do any of those things. Instead, she just took a can of this right here. It's just a little can of air, right? There you go. Just a little can of air. And so she takes this, this little can right here, goes to the space bar, presses it, and a cookie crumb comes flying out from underneath my space bar. I would like to tell you that my kids were eating cookies over my computer, but that would be a lie. And uh, I can't lie to the Holy Spirit. And so I was eating cookies over my computer. A crumb falls on there, gets underneath the space bar. And because a cookie crumb was in there, the space bar literally would not press down because of all the cookies that I was eating over on my computer. And I thought that, 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 that we're going to have to send it off, and it's going to be this whole ordeal. Well, I'm not going to have my computer. And all it took was just a little blast of air, and suddenly my computer was working again. You know, one of the Greek word for Holy Spirit in the New Testament is the same word for air or wind. And I think sometimes we face problems in our lives and, and we think it's going to be this huge ordeal and it's going to be complex and complicated and we need all these things to happen in order to fix this problem. Can I tell you, you only need one thing and that is a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit to blow through your life. When the wind of the Spirit of God blows through your life, everything can change, which means the answer to every prayer that you pray is more the Holy Spirit. You think, no, 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 I, I, I need more love. Well, Romans 5 says that the love of God is poured out in your hearts by the Holy Spirit. You think, no, 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 I, I need freedom. I need to get set free from this thing. Second Corinthians says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You think, no, 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 I need joy. I need, I need peace. Romans 14 says that the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You think, no, 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 I need power. Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The answer to every prayer that you pray is more of the Holy Spirit. So how can we get to know the Holy Spirit? How can we develop a deeper relationship with the Spirit of God so that we can receive everything that he has for us? You know, I know it can kind of be complicated sometimes. I don't exactly know how to relate to the Holy Spirit, how to, to develop a, a relationship with him. But developing a relationship with the Holy Spirit is, is similar to developing any kind of relationship or friendship in our lives. And so I want to tell you three things that you can do to experience a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit. Number one, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, part of being in a relationship with somebody is finding out what they love and what they hate so that you can do more of what they love and less of what they hate. If you are unaware of what somebody hates and you do that thing, it's going to cause problems in the relationship. You know, a, a while ago, uh, my wife and I were, were at Moe's getting ready to eat some food, and, 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 and she was like, hey, I'll take a burrito, and then she was like, hey, I need to go use the restroom, finish my order for me. And so I'm like, okay. And so they're like, hey, do you want beans on it? I'm like, ah, oh, I can't remember. Did she want beans on a burrito or not? And I'm like, ah, oh, everybody puts beans on their burrito at Moe's. So I'm like, yes, put beans on it. And like, what do you want, black beans or pinto beans? And I'm like, ah, oh, I can't remember what kind of beans. She's like, she's like, black beans or pinto beans? I'm like, I like pinto beans, pinto beans. And so I, I, I finish the order. She comes out of the bathroom, sits down, takes one one bite out of her burrito, and she goes, pinto beans? You put pinto beans on my burrito? I hate pinto beans. I said, I, I, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. Look, when have you ever seen me eat a pinto bean? Every time we've gone to a Mexican restaurant, I say no beans on it because I don't want pinto beans on my plate. Baby, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I just didn't know. And she is not letting this thing go. She just, pinto beans. I mean, it'd be one thing if you put black beans on it, but you didn't. You put pinto beans on it. I hate pinto beans. Pinto beans are like salty boogers. 
She has a hatred towards pinto beans that I found out that day. I did not know before this day, but, but now I know. And I have never, ever, ever, ever ordered pinto beans on anything ever again. They're like, do you want, pick, do you want the beans on the side? I'm like, no, no, no. Don't even put them in the bag, all right? Those aren't, they're not allowed in my house, right? Because if you want to walk in relationship with somebody, you have to know what they love and what they hate so that you can do more of what they love and less of what they hate. And so if you want to walk in relationship with the Holy Spirit, you need to know what he loves and what he hates. And the good thing about the Holy Spirit is that he actually tells us what he doesn't like so that we don't put it on his burrito, right? Thank God the Holy Spirit is not a woman who just expects us guys to figure it out, to be able to read minds from across the restaurant and know what she wants. Holy Spirit is very clear. He's like, I don't don't want this on my burrito. Here it is. Ephesians 4 verse 30. And do not grieve the Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So if you want to develop a friendship with the Holy Spirit, you can't do the things that grieve him. You can't do the things that cause him sorrow and distress. And this passage in Ephesians chapter four, it lists out all of the things that grieve the Holy Spirit. And when I was reading this verse and thinking about this list, it's none of the things that I thought, you know, would grieve the Holy Spirit. What's interesting about this verse on grieving the Holy Spirit, everything that it lists is about how we treat other people. See, the Holy Spirit loves people. So when you hold bitterness and resentment in your heart towards others, it grieves the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cares deeply about people. And so when you gossip and slander, it grieves the Holy Spirit. Anytime we violate the law of love, the Holy Spirit is grieved because the Holy Spirit is fiercely devoted to people, like all people, not just the people who are like you, not just the people that you like. No, he is fiercely devoted to everyone. And so if we want to walk in relationship with the Holy Spirit, we have to be kind, we have to be loving, and we have to be forgiving to everyone. Number two, keep in step with the Holy Spirit. You know, when it comes to relationships, there are are many people that try to win people over with big grand gestures, right? Like the unexpected vacation to a romantic destination, some big extravagant gift, you know, some expensive thing like diamonds and and jewelry. And, And of course, all those things have their place in relationships. But I've noticed that the couples who have the best relationships don't necessarily, you know, have all the big grand gestures. Rather, they do the small daily things to honor and serve the other person. Those are the couples that have the best relationships. They make the small daily decisions to honor and serve the other person. And so if you wanna walk in relationship with the Holy Spirit, you need to make those small daily decisions to honor him in everything that you do. See, many people think that walking with the Holy Spirit is about grand things, right? So I'm I'm gonna go into the mountains, right, for three days, no food, no water, just be alone with God, right? I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to drive across the country to go to this conference. I'm going to get on a plane and I'm going to fly across the world to go on this mission trip. And of course, all those things are good things. All those things can be catalysts for spiritual growth in our lives. But friendship with the Holy Spirit is built daily over time through small acts of obedience. And I think that's what Galatians 5.25 is talking about when it says, if we live by the Spirit, Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. See, keeping in step with the Spirit, that refers to a small daily decision, right? You you take thousands of steps each day. If if you got a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, you know exactly how many steps you take, right? You're trying to hit that 10,000 step a day, right? And so we take 10,000 steps a day. We make 10,000 decisions each day. And so if we want to walk in a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit, we have to honor him with each step that we take, that when he speaks, you respond. When he tells you to do something, you do it. When he tells you to give, you give. When he tells you to encourage, you encourage. When he says, don't do that, you don't do that thing. That wherever he leads, you follow. 
You know, as a pastor, I, I, I go to a lot of weddings, and, and I've noticed that there are some people that love dancing at weddings, right? They, they absolutely love it, right? They're on the dance floor. And there are other people that don't really love dancing at weddings. They'd they much rather kind of talk and hang out and eat food. But I've noticed that even the people who don't love to dance, whenever the cha-cha slide or the Cupid shuffle comes on, come on, everybody runs to the dance floor. Every good DJ, Joe, you know this, every good DJ knows, right? If you want to get people dancing, you just got to put on cha-cha slide or the Cupid shuffle and everybody runs to the dance floor. Why do people love that song so much? Because you don't need rhythm to dance to it, right? Like all you have to do is keep up with the steps, right? To the right, to the right, to the left, to the left. Right? You know. All you have to do is keep up with the steps. You don't need rhythm to dance to that song. You just keep up with the steps. Can I tell you that anyone can be a friend of the Holy Spirit? All you have to do is to the right. All you have to do is, I won't dance. I sang a couple weeks ago. I'm dancing this week. I promise you I'm done. All right? So I'm from Vegas, right? The performer just wants to to come out, I guess. Um, But anyone can be a friend of the Holy Spirit. All you have to do is keep in step with the Holy Spirit. That when he says move, you move. When he says go, you go. When he says stop, you stop. And if you keep in step with the Spirit, you can develop a deeper friendship and relationship with the Holy Spirit. And lastly, number three, make room for the Holy Spirit. You know, in our, our services on Sunday morning, we are, are limited with the amount of time that we have. We have three services and zero parking. And so we got to get people in and out. And so I wish that we had more time to create room in our services for the Holy Spirit to move. But that's why I love our encounter services, because encounter, there's only one service and we have just more time to let the Holy Spirit work and move in our lives. And and this coming Saturday is our encounter night for the month of October. And so I know it's usually on Thursday. This one is going to be on Saturday night. And so a special guest, Bob Hazlett, is going to be with us. And, And Bob Hazlett has a powerful prophetic ministry, right? When I say that this guy hears God, I mean this guy hears God. We had him at our church, I think it was four years ago. And I'm like, okay, he's a prophet. You know, he says he hears from God. I ain't telling this man nothing. If you hear God, I want to I want to know that you really hear God, right? And so he was doing something with the leaders of our church. And, and, and before we were in this building, we were in our old building, and, and he had a prophetic word about where we were moving as a church. He knew that the direction of the land that we were actually looking at buying. Um, we had, had had just put in an offer on this land that we're on right now. And so we we're going through the, the d- due diligence phase of all this stuff and um and so we're working through all that stuff. And so he has this prophetic word. He's like, yeah, I see you moving over there. And, and all this stuff about our church, he said, yeah, it's going to be you know, just a little over 10 acres of land and blah, blah, blah. It just talks about all these things. And 99% of everything that he said was like, I mean, exact, right on. There was only one thing that he was slightly off on, right? He, he, I didn't tell him anything about the land, but we were purchasing 9.6 acres of land here. But he said it was a little over 10 acres. And I thought, well, I mean, it's close. I'm right. He was really, I mean, he, he was within an acre of how much land, right? From, from not me telling him anything about our church. He knew nothing about it. And he got it down to the acre, right? 99% right. I thought, that's, that's pretty good, right? Pretty accurate, a little over 10 acres. So we go in to sign the papers for the land. And they say, oh, I'm sorry. Um, we, when we showed you the plot that you were buying, uh, we, we had drawn it out wrong. You had 9.6 acres. It's actually 10.4 acres that you're buying. <laughs> I was like, you got to be kidding me. This guy is ridiculous, right? He has a powerful prophetic gift. And we're so excited to welcome him and to have him back with us. So that's going to be Saturday night at five o'clock. And then he'll also be with us for all three of our services on Sunday morning if you can't make it. But as important as it is to make room for the Holy Spirit in our services, it's more important for us to make room for him in our daily lives. You know, if you want to know what a word in the Bible means, uh, you obviously you look up the definition of it in the, the Greek or in the, the Hebrew or depending on the Old or New Testament. But it's also helpful to find out the other places in Scripture where that word is used. And so in John chapter 20, Jesus appears to his disciples and he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And so if you want to know what it means to receive the Holy Spirit, then you look up other places where that word receive is used. 
And there's one place in scripture where that word is used that I think gives us context. It gives us a picture for us to wrap our, our, our imagination around of what it means to receive the Holy Spirit. And in John chapter six, Jesus came walking to his disciples on the water. They were already in a boat heading across and Jesus comes out to them walking on the water. And it says that they received Jesus into their boat. Now, when you have 12 men in a small fishing boat and you receive someone else into that boat, what do you have to do? You you gotta move, right? Like everybody has to move, everyone has to shift, everyone has to make adjustments in order to make room, in order to receive that other person. And that is exactly what we have to do with the Holy Spirit. We have to make room for the Holy Spirit in our lives. We have, to, we have to make adjustments. We have to shift things around. We have to move to create space for him in our lives. Because for most of you, you haven't even been told that you can have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, that you can talk to him, that you can tell him that you love him, that you can listen to him, that he wants to speak to you in your daily life, that he wants to walk with you and talk with you throughout the day. You haven't been told any of that. And so you've made no space for him in your life. You know he's God and he's, you know, a vibe. He's a force. He's a ghost. He's he's out there. But there's no room in our lives for the Holy Spirit. And so we need to move and adjust and shift things around in our life to make room for God with us, the Holy Spirit.